A Missionary Called by Joseph Center Part 1 Chapter 5 There is this great kid's book called Enemy Pie. I first found it at my dentist's office, dentists and doctor's offices being generally in otherwise terrible spots for good children's literature. The kid in the story has an enemy list with just one person on it, his new neighbor, Jeremy Ross, who does not invite him to a party or let him jump on his trampoline. I have an enemy list too, for reasons I hope less trite than that of the boy in Enemy Pie. It is not posted on a wall in my treehouse, just in my mind. Like the kid in the book, though, there is just one name on it. Scott Singer. I am a pretty easygoing guy, I think. I like people. I mean, I like most people. There are some whom I'm not particularly fond of, but before Scott Singer and since, I cannot say I have ever really hated someone. It's a strong word, after all. Wait! I know. Finger up in a sarcastically flashing light bulb over my head. Maybe I should euphemize it. I essentially, particularly, and deeply experience acute antipathy and aversion toward Scott Singer and everything about him. Sorry. I sat on the swing farthest from the porch light. It was buzzing with mosquitoes, and I was keeping my distance. Periodically, a lone, darting buzz would pass near or pause in my ear. I would swat at it. It would leave. I imagined it returned to report back to its crowd of friends hanging around the light, and then them all pointing, shielding their proboscises and looking askance, just like church and sacrament meeting every dang Sunday. Right there under the sagging ceiling of my front porch around the cobwebs of the yellow light are all the members of the branch jockeying for the best position so everyone can see just how close they are to the right and be jealous or better. Every once in a while, one, on a dare or out of duty, buzzes away from and all the while watched closely by the crowd to approach me or you. They're all pointing and talking. Did you hear about? Can you believe what? I can't imagine they're ever going to... I wonder if you ever felt it like I did, Aaron. You are so optimistic, so positive, that maybe you do not see it. Let them point, maybe you say to yourself. Let them talk. I can choose to be happy no matter what they say or do, right? Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's not real, for you or even at all. Remember, Aaron, if you have forgotten, their gossiping and pointing are far from without reason. They have never stopped talking about Mom walking out on Dad, or why and what Dad did about it. I mean, you still do not know all the answers, and I'm not ready, sorry, I'm just not, to fill you in. Not yet. Only a few people know, and none of them will say a word. The worst of it is when they actually pretend to your face that they do not talk behind your back, and then they approach with big smiles and firm handshakes and expect you to be just as mendaciously bubbly. The rain fell still. It fell on the house above me, on the graves out back, on the lake and the trees. It fell on the crows and the ducking daisies, the street and the passing cars. The front lawn flooded and boiled. Funny, I thought, about the mosquito church metaphor. The roof over all of us, the mosquitoes, me, the light, the dark, protects the bloodsuckers from the rain just like it shelters me. Nature, God, right, seems so unfair, sheltering both predator and prey. For he maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. <sighs> but then, really, am I not a bloodsucker too? Maybe he is fair. Maybe he just happens to love everyone. I felt like garbage. I should not have. I just graduated. I had a full summer ahead of me. In another life, things would have all been great under these circumstances. Instead, I felt like I should be out there in the yard letting all that rain fall on me. Just me. Making my own little personal black rain cloud dumping and dumping. But I did not move from the cover of the porch. I waited, letting everything else take it for me and soak and rot while I watched on, warm and dry. Brother Blythe had managed to reschedule the standing appointment with the singers from 7 to 5. I had hoped to squeeze in a few graduation parties before heading to Casper's. I didn't say anything about it to him, though. He figured it out on his own and rescheduled anyway. He was a good man. I hated going to the singers. It was like going to church and all those false smiles and furtive fingers. Ooh, hey, there are the cross kids. Better stop talking. I heard their dad's getting worse. Remember what their mother did? 
And if they are not saying it, they are thinking it, and then they look at you and curl back their lips into the form of a smile and shake your hand. The driveway was a muddy river, sloshing and narrow, stretching an unbending half mile out to Vassold Road. It was thickly wooded from the edge of the front yard out to the pavement. The road was dark and silent, just the hum and clatter of rain on water and leaves, until Brother Blythe's minivan turned onto the drive. Headlights swept across the shining wet trees. He drove slowly. I rebuttoned the top of my shirt and tightened my tie. I stood and rolled the ensign tight. Brother Blythe stopped at the edge of the walk in front of the house. I ducked and jogged to the van. Afternoon, he said cheerfully as I climbed in. Brother Blythe was one of the very few from church, or of the adults who knew about the whole cross saga, who did not seem to care. He was genuinely concerned about us, happy to see us, interested in us. Him and President Larson. Genuine. The singers certainly were not. Hi. Like his and President Larson's exception to the mosquito around the porch light rule, Brother Blythe was an exception to the smile hatred I have at church. Brother Blythe was true. Brother Blythe was not a gossip. He did not seem to have anything to hide or an interest in finding out what anyone else was hiding. I closed the door. I'll say the prayer tonight, if that's okay, he said. We turned onto Vassold Road and he smiled broadly and said, Congratulations, by the way, you graduated. I nodded. Well, how is it? His unflagging good cheer always amazed me. Good. Did you get rained out? People think I'm stuck up because I don't talk much. Yes. I really never understood it. Have you heard that before, Aaron? People say it all the time. I'm not stuck up. I think Brother Blythe gave me the benefit of the doubt. Have it in the gym? Mm-hmm. It was really hot. Humid, too, I'll bet. The principal's glasses kept fogging up. She couldn't read the names. A minute later, he spoke again. Sure has rained a lot. Mm-hmm. Suppose that's just weather in Michigan, huh? Yeah. Another minute passed. You're 19 in August, right? Yes. When do you send in your papers? End of June. So this month? I nodded. Do you know where you might want to go? Yeah, it's not sightseeing. I don't care where I go. Brother Blythe's cheer shifted to pride and his exuberance reverenced. That's really great, Eugene. He took a couple breaths, savoring, like inhaling the crisp thunderstorm air, the apparent coolness of a sincere teenager, and then asked, What are you going to do about college? I have to wait until I come back. Know where you want to go? Well, I've been accepted to BYU already. What do you want to study? Literature. Another minute. Working this summer? I've got an interview tomorrow. Where? Cistercian booksellers. That sounds right up your alley. Another minute. How's your girlfriend? Fine. Several minutes this time. Heavy minutes. Eugene, he started. He'd set aside the cheeriness. I looked at him. The sky through the window behind him was clearing out over the lake. It made the sky lighter there. Not in terms of luminance, necessarily, but poetically, perhaps, in terms of weight. Do you like home teaching? I inhaled and shrugged. I shifted in my seat. Well, yeah, I guess. It's the right thing to do. I like that. It's not fun and games, if that's what you mean. I paused, then added, and to be honest, the singers are not my favorite. Brother Blythe nodded, his expression inscrutable. I watched the rain fall through the headlight beams as I waited for a follow-up. I'm glad you want to do what's right, he said. This is right. Going on a mission is right. You're a good man, Eugene. It surprised me how this last bit actually helped me feel better. Helped me feel a little deeper that this was the right thing to do. That maybe it helped me to not be the person that so many people, like the singers, and for that matter, me too, thought I was. And helped me from being, at least temporarily, the person I feared. It helped me feel that maybe this made it easier for the Lord to overlook so much of the bad stuff. So much of everything else. I thought about our parents again. When Mom left, like I said, the members turned a shifty, prying eye on the three crosses remaining. People became either very friendly, too friendly with those big fake smiles and handshakes, or very distant, still staring and talking, though if approached, of course, broadly smiling and solicitous. There were semi-frequent anonymous, 
anomalous, as far as I'm concerned, and common dinners appearing on our doorstep and semi-frequent, less anonymous fingers and whispers pointing from across the chapel. Even now, eight years later, it still happened. Even our home teachers had been more consistent for a time and prying for gossip before giving up entirely and leaving us alone, finally and for good. Nothing else ever happened. Nothing replaced what Mom did. The rest of the drive to the singers was quiet. The rain continued to wash across the windshield, cleared rhythmically by the mechanical thump and hum, thump and hum of the wipers. <laughs>